On July 28, 1914, Europe echoed to the gunfire of a new war. At that point, no one imagined that this conflict would reach such colossal scale and turn into a global battle of attrition that would go down in history as the Great War. The nations that started this war planned to crush their opponents in a few months' time with decisive offensive strikes. But Europe was crossed with trench lines from the northern to the southern coasts instead. Offensive operations bogged down in deep layered defenses and brought meager results at the cost of great losses. To break the stalemate, the rivaling sides came up with more and new means of destroying the enemy. During those years, flamethrowers and poison gas appeared, and fighter planes made their first combat flights. At that particular time, Great Britain brought the first tanks to the battlefield. The first heavy tank, Mark I, was created by the then Colonel of Royal Engineers, Ernest Dunlop Swinton. His ideas and concepts could be embodied in metal, thanks to the first Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, the head and creator of the Landship Committee of the Admiralty. It seems odd that a naval authority created a weapon meant for land-based warfare. Well, the Army's command headed by Lord Kitchener was not only uninterested in Colonel Swinton's ideas, but also actively opposed their implementation. The Army was really convinced that they had no need for tanks. The new machine's name appeared because the workers who assembled the bodies were sure that they were engaged in the making of water tanks for the irrigation works in Mesopotamia. Legend has it that they were initially to be named water carriers, but it was quickly abandoned because Albert Stern had no intentions of being secretary of the WC committee, WC being an abbreviation for a lavatory. On the early morning of September 15, 1916, in the vicinity of the villages Fleur and Corselet on the River Soma, about 30 tanks attacked the German troop positions. The British had 49 tanks altogether, but they could not bring them all to bear because many machines were inoperable due to mechanical issues. But just three dozen thundering steel boxes, spewing machine gun and cannon fire were enough to plunge the German troops into shock. Eyewitnesses recalled that the Germans rubbed their eyes in disbelief, seeing the devilry bearing down on them. The shock did not last long. Soon the Germans came to their senses and knocked out about 17 machines with return fire. As a result of the first battle, the British managed to move only five kilometers behind enemy lines, obtaining only a small tactical victory. Nevertheless, it was a promising result for a first try. The main thing that became clear on that day was that tanks were not a dead-end project. The new weapon could and needed to be developed further. But it took almost a quarter of a century for the tanks to become a main strike force in land warfare. During this time, the largest European countries not only improved the designs of their tanks, but also developed doctrines of their appropriate use in combat. Alas. The British could not maintain their leading role in any of these areas. The main reason for the pioneers of the industry to fall far behind their competitors was that the British command had not come to an agreement as to the role of the tank in battle. Two points of view were clearly distinguished. According to the first, tanks were needed for the direct support of the infantry units. Supporters of the second point of view pointed that armor should be used for purposes formerly done by the cavalry. Fast breakthroughs, circling of the enemy, and rearward raids Without having a clear answer, the British sat on two chairs at once, splitting tanks into infantry and cruiser classes. The first ones were slow and heavily armored. The latter were more mobile and thin-skinned. The weapons for both categories were basically the same, though the infantry tanks were supposed to be armed with machine guns only at first. By the start of the Second World War in 1939, the British were in possession of quite an extensive tank fleet. However, out of the entire fleet of machines which was in service with the Royal Tank Corps, only several machines packed an acceptable combat value. Of all the infantry tanks of the war, the ones definitely worth mentioning are the Matilda II, the Valentine, and the Churchill. The Matilda II was one of the most heavily armored tanks in the early part of the Second World War. Only the projectiles of German 88 and Italian 90mm anti-aircraft guns could reliably pierce its armor. In the Battle of Arras on May 21, 1940, these tanks drove through the Tokenkopf SS Regiment, broke up two infantry regiments of the 7th Armor Division of the Wehrmacht, and destroyed a battalion of anti-tank guns. Only the aforementioned 88mm guns were able to stop the British onslaught. The Valentine was just a sturdy and efficient machine. In fact, at the start of the war, it only lacked a powerful gun. But this affliction was common to all the British tanks without exception. 
The high command believed that the 40 mm two-pounder gun was more than enough for a tank. But Britain's first defeats on the battlefield ruthlessly refuted this belief, particularly against soft targets. So the Valentine got a 57 mm six-pounder cannon installed, starting from the third variant. The tank's gun was later increased up to 75 mm, but that was the limit. The Churchill was a heavy tank. Its design was more corresponding to the requirements of the First World War. However, it was designed with room for upgrades, which the British managed to use to the maximum. The Churchill underwent more than a dozen design changes before it left the front line. It could mount weapons including a 75mm gun, 95mm howitzer, or a flamethrower. This particular modification causing such hatred among the German troops that its crews were rarely taken prisoners. Cruiser tanks that were in service with the Royal Tank Corps were not known for good reliability throughout the war. But in the years 1939 to 1941, it was especially noticeable. Numbers of non-combat losses several times exceeded the allowable limit, so that efforts to improve the cruiser tanks were constantly conducted by the British. As a result, they managed to design and build a large number of different armored machines, but failed to come up with a perfect cruiser tank. Let us mention the Covenanter as an example of a not-so-great cruiser tank. This tank, with suspension designed by Walter Christie, constantly broke down and was really disliked by the troops because of this. And while the engineers tried to problem-solve, the tank became outdated and was replaced with a more successful tank, the Crusader. This vehicle was Britain's main cruiser tank for some time. Though it was not defined by great durability or battlefield qualities, it was still armed with a good old six-pounder cannon, broke down often, and was replaced with the really fine, by British standards particularly, Cromwell tank in 1943. Cromwell was indeed a breakthrough for the British tank building industry. It was equipped with a Meteor aircraft engine with artificially lowered rev limit. The power of this engine was enough to propel the tank to 60 kilometers per hour. The Cromwell also had a gun of a bigger caliber, 75 millimeter. If the Germans did not have Tigers and Panthers on hand, the Cromwell would have been enough to solve most of the combat tasks assigned to the Armored Corps by modern warfare circumstances. The British only got a truly excellent tank after the end of the Second World War. This was the Centurion. Its performance characteristics were roughly the same as the Panthers, but it had decent armor angles and a 17-pounder cannon. The later modification saw the cannon upgraded to 105 mm. In this form, the tank was in service with the British Army until the 1970s. After the Second World War, when Germany had been defeated, the relations between the countries of the anti-Hitler coalition quickly deteriorated. Already perceiving the Soviet Union as a potential enemy, the British developed special heavily armed tanks designed to withstand such formidable machines as IS-3. These saw shape as Carnarvon and Conqueror. Conquer was armed with a 120mm rifled gun, which could only fire while the tank stopped. These tanks were produced in a total of about 180 units. The production was cancelled afterwards. Summarizing, it can be said that Britain, because of its geographical situation, had always emphasized its navy over the army. The Second World War had made the British hastily reconsider its priorities for technology. And as far as possible, with the amendment to the general conservatism inherent in the British nation, the British coped with this task, not only through the development of their own tanks, but also the modification of military vehicles from the USA. However, this is a theme of a different story.